Actually, it's uh, always much of a pleasure and privilege. Uh, it's a very difficult task to introduce an eminent person who, who everybody knows. You know, he needs no introduction, really speaking. Uh, but we have with us today Dr. Bimal Patel, well-known architect, urbanist, academic, who has been actively involved in exploring ways in which architecture, urban design, and planning can enrich the lives of people in our country. Welcome, sir, on behalf of the Indian Institute of Architects. Dr. Vimal Patel is the Chairman and Managing Director of HCP Design, Planning and Management Private Limited, one of the topmost architectural firms in India. HCP was founded in 1960 at Ahmedabad by his illustrious father, late architect Hasmukh Patel, one of the pioneer masters of in India. Uh, Dr. Vimal Patel joined the establishment firm in 1990. Today, under his able leadership, SCP is a multidisciplinary design practice with over 300 employees and offices in Ahmedabad, Delhi and Pune. SCP provides professional consultancy services in architectural design, interior design, engineering, urban design, urban planning, communications, project management, construction management and what have you. Dr. Vimal Patel graduated with a diploma in architecture from the SEPT at Ahmedabad in 1984. He received a dual master's in architecture in, and city planning in 1988 and a PhD in city and regional planning in 1995 from the University of California, the Berkeley campus. Since 2012, he has also been heading the prestigious SEP University at Ahmedabad as, as his president. Dr. Patel's professional practice has focused on transforming urban design and planning practices to make them more effective in and in improving Indian cities. In 1996, he founded the EPC, the Environmental Planning Collaborative, a non-for-profit consultancy, policy research and advocacy organization. His research interests include land use planning, real estate markets, building regulations, land management, and history of urban planning. The list of architectural and urban design projects successfully executed by HCP is equally impressive, notable amongst these, the, the list is too long, but I'll just mention a few. The Reserve Bank of India in Ahmedabad, the Chinubai Center and the Patanga Revolving Restaurant, which many of you know in Ahmedabad. Entrepreneurship Development Institute, a unique project which received for him the Aga Khan Award, a very prestigious award. The Management Center in New, and, and the new campus in uh, IIM at Ahmedabad, the Aga Khan Academy in Hyderabad, uh, he did the post-disaster development planning of Bhuj after the uh, massive earthquake and his worked on several town planning schemes in Gujarat. Uh, there is a township to his credit in Bhutan in 2015 and amongst the notable projects of redevelopment and urban design is the Kankaria Lake uh, development in Ahmedabad. Perhaps the most prestigious project in India today he is also doing the Central Vista redevelopment in New Delhi, which all of you know about. The, amongst his numerous awards and laurels to his credit are the most prestigious Aga Khan Award in Architecture, the Prime Minister's Award for Excellence in Urban Planning and Design, in 2000, and in 2019, the most coveted national honor, the Padma Shri, at the hands of the President of India. Uh, coming to today and his keynote address, Uh, today, his keynote address today is on public projects and public discourse. Since, in a democracy, public projects and public discourse always go hand in hand. Dr. Mimal Patel will present two of his public projects, the Sabarmati Riverfront Development Project and the Vishwanath Dam in Varanasi. He will talk about the concerns and apprehensions that people had about these projects and the public discussions that they generated. He will also present the philosophy and practice of communication that HCP has developed over the time to engage with public discourse around public projects. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much.
thank you very much for inviting me here. It's very kind of you to have done so. Very kind of you all to have come to listen to what I have to say. Uh, two or three things with reference to my introduction. Uh, there were three or four projects mentioned there, which I had nothing to do with. My father did, the Reserve Bank, etc. So discount all of that. Uh, I work with a large group of really fine colleagues. And the work that I get to present uh, is, of, is possible only because all of us work together. So I'm thankful to them for the privilege of being able to present uh, what we all do together. It's not me, it's all of us together. So I just want to make that. I'm going to talk about public projects and public discourse. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's not something I've spoken about earlier. I'm going to show two projects, but the projects is not the focus. The focus is the public discourse that develops around public projects. And uh, if we are to do public projects, we must learn how to engage with that much better. And that's what I want to talk about. So let me start with the presentation. So it's, it's in four parts. But the first is public dis some, some introductory comments that I want to make. Public projects are projects that are done with public money on public land to solve public problems, usually commissioned by public authorities. They are bound to generate a public discourse. It's completely legitimate and that discourse is something that we should all welcome. It goes hand in hand in a democracy, public discourse, public projects go hand in hand. Everybody gets involved. In, first and foremost, the people who are affected by the project. Uh, for example, in, when I was doing the Sabarmati project, the people who were living in slums along the river, they are affected by it. And obviously, they have something to say about it. Concerned citizens, professionals, activists, ideologues, pundits, critics, academics, politicians, journalists, supporters of the project, uh, and detractors, people who are opposed to it for a variety of reasons might be, for very uh, genuine concerns, philosophical differences, or sometimes plainly for political differences. Everybody gets, it's a big, huge amount of discussion that public projects generate. This discussion happens almost everywhere. It's like a big cloud. It happens in homes, cafes and addas, dinner parties, schools. Social media these days is extremely important. The press, television, sometimes on the streets because there are protests and people are coming out there and talking about things. Assemblies, parliaments and eventually some portions of the discussion also end up in the courts. So this is bound to happen. It's absolutely legitimate and it's absolutely uh, uh, welcome in some ways. When you hear this big amount, big public discourse, there are people talking, they're arguing, they're reasoning, they're convincing each other, they're speculating, sometimes they're misleading, sometimes they're provoking, sometimes they're faking things, uh, scaremongering, shouting, agreeing, Disagreeing. I mean, it's a huge uh, uh, discussion, national level discussion sometimes. And ultimately, if the project is to go ahead, as we all know, all the people with all their differences and all their different preferences are never going to be able to come up with a consensus. Somehow, we are going to have a process. We have to have a process for agreeing to disagree and moving forward. Otherwise, nothing happens. Uh, and that is what mature democracies manage to do well. Uh, at the outset, let me say that well-informed, fact-based, reasoned, and constructive discourse can provide immensely valuable feedback 
for the design of public projects. It can help improve the projects, it can help propel them forward, and it can help tackle many of the monumental challenges that our cities and the country are facing. Ultimately, a good quality of public discourse strengthens democracy. So it's not just meant to improve projects, it's meant to nourish our democracy. Let me also say that ill-informed, ideological, irrational, obstructive discourse can mislead the public, disrupt or stall projects, leave problems unsolved, and prove that democracies, you know, can be dysfunctional. If you have a public discourse that is not doing its job, people put their hands up and say, ah, this democracy is a problem. It's better to be like China. I don't agree. I think that government agencies and professionals, we just need to learn how to better engage with the public. We need to improve our pra projects by the feedback that we get. And we need to ensure that public discourse around public projects is better informed. Now at the outset, let me say this is a, a task yet to be done. Because in India, we do not have a culture of engaging with the public, not a widespread culture. We are a traditional society where people in positions of authority do not believe in explaining themselves to people who are not in authority. Just think of your families and your homes. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are older siblings. We believe that the younger siblings must trust them. They should not question them. Why should I have to explain? Parents don't explain things to kids. I'm sure there are terrific exceptions to this, but by and large, we don't have a culture of people in position of, of power explaining things to people in the public. And unless we develop that culture, both in government and in professional organizations, our democracy is likely to suffer. Projects are likely to suffer. So we have to work to improve public discourse. I'm going to talk about two public projects that I have been involved in for many, many years. Both of them have generated a lot of discussion. It's not the Central Vista, I'm not going to talk about that. It's too large to talk about that. Uh, 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 I'm going to talk about the discourse around them, some of the topics that got discussed. And then I'm going to quickly show you the techniques that we have developed and the capacities that we have built in our organization to better engage with the public. I have been always a great believer that things must be explained and we must use public discussion to improve projects. And what has HCP done about this for years? Okay? And I just want to give you some examples of that in general. So let me start with the first project. So this is a, think of it as a, as a project interlude. I'm going to talk first about the project so you get a sense of what this, how complex this project was and how many different issues it uh, touched. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the kind of concerns that were raised with this project. So Savarmati Riverfront Development is an urban revitalization, environmental improvement, and social development project. It started in 1996. Uh, so it was, uh, that was when I was first asked to work on it. So it's a long time ago. And it's still going on, though most of the first phase work is finished, projects like this continue. Think of the Thames, think of Paris, uh, Riverfront, even 150 years later, they are rebuilding whatever has been done. So this is still ongoing, they are also doing the second phase. So let me start by explaining this project to you. So here you can see Ahmedabad. Okay. Uh, they, uh, let me see if this pointer works. Yeah, it does. So that's the Sabarmati River. All of that is Ahmedabad. It's 20 kilometers across. It's fairly compact. Uh, it's 300 square kilometers of urbanization. And the river flows from up here to down below. That's an image of it in the year 
2000. So, Sabarmati in 2000 was a place to dump garbage, polluted by sewage, untreated sewage flowing into the river, encroached upon by informal housing, slums, hemmed in by development, flood prone, and inaccessible. That's what the riverbank looked like. 11 kilometers of this is just one picture of it. Because a barrage had been built in 1976, the river had also become a seasonal linear lake in the middle of the city. That barrage held monsoon water and then the water was used for irrigation, so it got empty. But it was like this, a lake in the middle of the city, but inaccessible. So that's Ahmedabad in 96, you can see this year. I got involved in 96-97, and that's the comprehensive master plan that we prepared at that time. It looked at everything that the river needed. These problems cannot be solved piecemeal. They have to be tackled together. Okay, that's the important thing. Infrastructure, slums, water retention, land ownership, roads, river hydraulics, flooding, everything has to be seen comprehensively. One thing affects the other. You will understand why I say so. Between 80, uh, 98 and 2004, we were also managers to this project. At that time, nobody was interested in this project. Nobody believed it could be done. Nobody in the municipal corporation thought it could be done. So our job was simple. Do everything necessary for the project to be brought to implementation stage. And that's what we did. It included a lot of studies, building consensus, promoting the project. So we used to report to the board. The Riverfront Company, which was owned by the municipal corporation, had no more than one half-time employee. Nobody else was there. It's just us bringing the project to a stage of development. So just to give you a quick glimpse, this is the year 2001, it was the year of the earthquake. Project was ready, but it couldn't be implemented. As you can see, that's the river here. Uh, here, just to orient you just a little better, this is the walled city of Ahmedabad. And that's the rest of Ahmedabad. You can see the river here of varying width. And that's in 2002, we had the terrible riots, and that project didn't move. Then in 2004, the project was commenced. Incidentally, it was a Congress government in charge when the project started. That's in 2006. You can see the project work ongoing here. You can see the embankments being built. You can see in 2007, more embankments built. And even more 2009, 2015. Most of the heavy work of the project is finished the land is still slowly getting developed. And that's 2020, still ongoing. That's what the river looks like now. It has 11 objectives in this project. The first one was to make the riverfront accessible to everybody. I told you that because of development, which had come right up to the edge of the river, and because of slums, the the river was inaccessible. Nobody could walk along the length of the river on the two sides. You could only cross the bridges and enjoy the river. So what was done was embankments were built and a sliver of land on either side was, was reclaimed from the bed of the river. By doing this, we ended up creating two square kilometers of public domain along 11 kilometers of the river. Every river is different. You cannot do this everywhere. But in the case of Sabarmati, because of its, its special natural characteristics, this was a correct response. If it's a rocky river, you can't do this. If it's a narrow river, you can't do this. So please do not believe that I'm suggesting that this be done everywhere. So uh, this involved a lot of work. Actually, it was not very complicated. There was a wall built, not very thick. You know, the wall is, and then there's a, there's a foundation that goes into the bed of the river. It's a sandy bed, and this was done. It didn't take very long, but a lot of sand 
was taken from the river and put on the sides to create this reclaimed land. Today, the project has entirely socialized what used to be earlier a private edge. Everybody who had a private property sitting on the edge of the river, uh, now the public could keep the edge. What used to look like this, this is from the summer of perhaps 81, uh, now looks like this. So you have a whole sliver of land on two sides which is used. The second job was to stop the flow of sewage. Now there were nullas like this bringing untreated sewage. There were many locations at which sewage was coming directly. It was not possible to stop the flow of sewage. So what was done was an interceptor drain, which is this, this red line, was built to take all that sewage and divert it to the sewage treatment plants in this place and this place here. That's, that's a line. When you're, this line is embedded in the, in, the, in the reclaimed area, then it's not very complicated. And it's not very expensive either. If you want to build it alone, it will be very expensive to build an interceptor sewer like this. Today the flow of sewage is almost completely stopped. There are one or two places where some works are still required because of which. But the water is clean. There is no sewage flowing directly into the river. Third job was to replenish the river and recharge groundwater. Remember I told you that they are a sandy bed. And we have monsoon water that collects here, but all of it is continuously seeping into the ground. So and some of it is evaporating. If we want this lake to remain, become a perennial lake, then we have to continuously add water to it. Presently that water comes from the Narmada, but now the real plan for this is to take the treated sewage water and put it back in. So it becomes a grand recharge scheme for the city. city is pumping water out from the ground, uses it, turns it into sewage, treats it, puts it back in. Fourth was to provide housing for informal slum dwellers. There are many slums like this. I mean rivers, river banks become the place where informal housing will come up because these people have nowhere else to go. It's not wonderful conditions, huh? There's no water supply, there's no sewage, there is, it's a flood prone area, periodically people get flooded. Okay. The, what the project proposed, you see, because we were going to, 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 to reclaim, sorry, I'll just show you here, we were going to reclaim land here. So what was eventually done was all these slums here along the banks were moved to relocation housing within the city, not complete outskirts. Some of it was, but most of it was within the city. That's, we weren't architects unfortunately for this. I would have done better housing I think than this. But it's better than the slums for many people it's a great improvement in life. Each of the apartments, small 25, 35 square meter apartments that were given, was worth at the time 10 lakh rupees each. So there were many happy families and guess how many families were moved? 11,000 families were moved from the banks of the river where they had a precarious existence to housing of this sort. Fifth job was to reduce the risk of erosion and flooding. We get torrential floods like this. When there is the monsoon, of course there are dams upstream, much in the same way that Pune has. But when the dam is opened, and then we get floods like this, and this is a small flood. Okay. In the past, remember we have sandy banks. We don't have banks. Uh, rocky banks. So the sand would get eroded and whoever could afford it had built walls like this. 
whoever could not afford it, their land would get washed away. By the way, Gandhi Ashram survives only because the a great big concrete wall, wall was built in front of it in the 1960s. Otherwise, it would not have been there today. Because that's the site that gets eroded very fast. Today, we have one continuous wall that protects the entire city. It's a common wall. And this is during a flood in 2015. You can see that lower level. You can see those trees that are submerged. That's a lower level walking area that's submerged. And when the flood recedes, well, that's what it becomes. We're the same place, same time. So the city has essentially been protected from erosion and flooding. Many low-lying areas have also been protected by this. We used to have flooding in the low-lying neighborhoods along some parts of the city. Sixth job was to create riverfront promenades and parks. And you can see all these green patches here. So 54% of the land that was reclaimed has been converted into promenades and parks. And we have added a million square meter of parks and promenades. This was one prime objective of the project. You can see here, that's the lower promenade. That's the water that is stored. On the left-hand side are walls that are meant to protect when there is a flood. They are not meant for this. The walls are tall, but they also cut you off from the city and give you a very special atmosphere at the lower level. That's the kind of parks that are coming up. This is a very early picture. All these trees have now grown and it's a completely green area. This is one of the parks that has come up. Here's another one along the place. There was lots of land, so now lots of parks could be built depending on which neighborhood it was in. Sometimes they're even lit up like this, colorful ways. So that's the event garden and the flower garden in Amtabad. The seventh objective was to create trade, cultural and social amenities. So one of the big things, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of the big things was the Sunday market. We had a flea market, which is frequently really by poor people. It's not, it's not a rich people's market, it's not a fancy market. But it's a long market. This is what you can see uh, all along, an open-air market, where lots of people are selling. This is the kind of shops. And actually, this market works for the whole surrounding area. So it's an open-air market. There were many washer folk who used to earlier use the river to wash their wash clothes and their business was affected. So a laundry complex was created for them. So that's a picture from the laundry complex. There are many sports facilities like this along the river because now there is land and you can build that. And you know, on the eastern side here is a tiny neighborhood size sports facility. Eighth job was to revitalize the areas on both sides of the river. Obviously, when you improve the river, the surrounding areas will start seeing development. It has to be better planned. And indeed, we will see high-rise development coming up. Very special local plans have been made for these surrounding areas because that needs to be guided. And what used to be a river like this, you see, in the early 80s, uh, and that's, you know, that's how I remember it, because this was not built as yet. Uh, it was a river of this sort, which now is a river like this. And slowly, buildings will come up on the two sides. And this will provide, one portion at least, will provide an important business district for Amdhavad, which is well planned. This is not just on paper. Many developers you will see in Amdhavad have bought extra FSI on both sides and are building buildings. And you see in their brochures, they are saying India's first developed river front city introducing a real estate project next to it, etc., etc. It's nice because the city is also gaining in the form of revenues. Ninth objective was to improve Ahmedabad street network. What we were able to do was there was no north-south link. It was very complicated road like this uh, in the network. And so we were able to add two major streets and these streets were designed to go in and out so that the river is not cut off by the streets. So you can see some places 
where the, river, where the road runs along the river, some places on the outside, so and so forth. And that's, that's the street, you can see it here. You can see the street going down this way, on the other side, so on and so forth. And that street has now become an important arterial route for Ahmedabad, cutting down travel times in many, many places. Tenth objective was to pay for the riverfront. Who's going to pay for all of this? And so the idea was that we would sell 14.5% of the land that we have reclaimed to pay for everything. The entire project is a self-financing project and doesn't use taxpayer money. And well-designed guidelines are there and this is one of the first projects that has come up there. The total project cost, relocation housing, was 1100 crores. I told you 11,000 families, 10 lakhs each, that's 1100 crores. And construction, other cost, everything together is about 3,000 crores. This is, this is a, a not a large sum. But the best part is that it comes, the taxpayers don't have to pay for it, even that. The eleventh objective, and this is a meta objective, was to build Ahmedabad's capacity to tackle complex urban problems. Cities need to learn how to do this. Unless they learn, they fester in the problems that they have. And also, the objective, in a sense, was political. To bring Ahmedabadis together around a large civic project that they take pride in. Now, this happens through the public discourse. There's lots of agreement, disagreement. Finally, what the project does is builds a sense of pride and a sense of confidence that we can solve problems. So here you are. This is very recent. Uh, you know, people now take a lot of pride uh, in their riverfront. Here you can see there are many festivals, many events and this will go on. I don't, nobody has to design them, now the people own the riverfront. Of course there's a lot of pride in the river. Most recently we had this gentleman visiting us and he went and also got himself pictured at our riverfront. So this project was all about bringing people back to the river and the river back to the people. Now what were the major issues get, that got talked about while the project was underway? Okay. The first big concern, and legitimate one, because of the history of poor ways of doing projects, was that slum dwellers will be made homeless. You know the outcome, I've told you already, that actually the project never intended to, uh, to evict the slum dwellers or to throw them out. It in fact intended to bring them many benefits, and it has today brought them benefits. Uh, you know, a project in which the construction cost is almost as much as the rehabilitation cost, how can anyone claim that it is anti-poor? And yet, you know, it was a detailed process, lots of surveys were done. Everybody's properties, including things like this, were valued by professional valuers. Okay. Of course, the, issue, the, 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 the whole process, uh, I mean, the issue went to court and the High Court sort of overs oversaw the entire process. The nice thing they did was they asked a simple question. Are you planning to throw these people out? No, project doesn't intend to. Okay, what's your plan? The plan was submitted and the High Court supervised the implementation of the plan. This is uh, an allotment fair where people were getting houses, allocated housing, so it's an allocation fair that was in process. Towards the end, you could see by the time 10,000 families moved from the riverfront to get flats by August 10, 10,000 families had been moved. Towards the end, this process became politicized. And once it was politicized, uh, you know, before it got politicized, a lot of effort was made to convince people that this is a social upliftment project. But, towards the end, High Court ordered some evictions and demolitions. Okay. And that gave a lot of bad press to the project. So, 
1,000 out of the 11,000 families at the very end were elected to term temporary housing. Later on, they were also given housing. But the narrative that people were able to build up was that it's a non-inclusive project, that the project exemplifies neoliberal transformation. People say a neoliberal. Uh, people write whole books about this project and how it is an exclusionary project. And you have articles like this, uh, uh, people's PhD thesis, talking about how this project actually excludes the poor. Most of this was done uh, during the process. And I believe that it wasn't just a problem of people looking at things with a jaundiced eye. It was also a problem of the Riverfront Project not able to engage sufficiently well and provide the information. So I think that the fault for this negative discourse is actually on both sides. Many people complain that the washerfolk and Sunday market vendors will lose their livelihoods. But you know the outcome. A huge market has been built, it's functioning well, it used to be this small. Now, it's this large, that same spot. And yet, that's, that's the, for the washer folk. Yet, there was lots of, lots of people were able to tell the press that this bazaar is going to go away, we are going to wipe out the bazaar, etc. Now, of course, they are seeing it from that point of view. Here is the mayor of Ahmedabad and the commissioner making a statement that we are, we are going to do this, folks. But I believe that if this had been done a little bit beforehand, and if the discourse was a little well informed, it would have been better. Third was the project will reduce the river's flood carrying capacity. The project will cause flooding. This is what a narrative that a lot of people initially were able to build up. I showed you, the floods are, have come in, they recede, and the whole project is functioning well. What happened was in 2006, when the project was ongoing, we had a big flood like this. And, the, and, and, and we used it as an opportunity to check the computer simulations of what we had done. Yet, at that time, of course, there was a great state of alarm. Everybody felt, oh my God, such a flood. Some of the contractors had not taken enough care, so their equipment got washed out. So they were able to, you know, the people saw damage. Of course, an issue like this really causes problem. And you know, the real problem is that river hydraulics is a technical subject. It's counterintuitive. Often, it's not understandable. It's like an aeroplane which is heavier than air. How come it flies? So people keep asking the question that you're going to narrow this river and it is still going to carry the same amount of water. How is that possible? Non-technical people don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, they believe there's some problem with it. Now, we should take care of these sort of, 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 of situations and ensure that the public is better informed. It's difficult, but it is only through that that a level of trust can be built. Of course, at that time, an additional study was done and the project moved ahead, uh, but a well-informed public would have been a better situation. High concrete walls will cut off the river from the city. See, when people would see these sort of walls, they say, oh my God, what is this? So we developed Many techniques, they saw walls like this and this, and say, e kya bana hai? It's very difficult for people to imagine what this place will be like. So to get people to imagine this, and I'll tell you more about this later, we started drawing up visualizations of this sort to explain what this is going to be. And this sort here, that this, this land is actually going to be a park. Or here, this is Gandhi Ashram steps, and we said someday it will look like this. And we held exhibitions where these views were shown to people. And here's a 
news cutting from that time, 2010, saying, what's your take on the river front? This was, this was fairly successful. Another narrative that people went into was this is being built for the rich, not for the poor. Now, I find that very surprising given that we are, uh, you know, we are, we, are, we, we, we propose to sell 14.5% of the land, and yet we would have people like this questioning, you see, saying, is it for the rich or the poor? Obviously, public discourse is going to have all sorts of people. You can't afford to not have people question. I'm not saying don't stop them. I'm saying we could do better. Yeah, you, you know, do we really need Sabarmati model? Uh, beautification. It's not a beautification project. It's a, it's a flood control. It's a sl social upliftment, etc. It's everything together. Of course, beautification results from it. And, 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 and a lot of people were able to build up that sort of narrative. And I would keep saying to them that originally the project proposed to sell 20% of the land because we thought we will need to sell that much to pay for the project. Later on, this was reduced to 14.5. And yet, it was impossible to convince some people that this is meant to be a self-financing project. This is a fairly good deal. 14.5 uh, is not a bad amount of and yet some of the people philosophically were against the sale of any public land and they would go to town with this sort of discussion. So today it's only 15%, 14.5 for sale and there is bylaws that keep the river edge completely open such as in this case nobody builds compound walls, nobody is allowed to build compound walls there. Another narrative was project misuse is precious Narmada water. Water will be stagnant and dirty. Yes, it's true, just now we use Narmada water because it's freely available. But now the Narmada water is not going to be available and Ahmedabad is going to have to use this. This is how public projects work. When it's available, free city says, we take about me And here you can see newspaper cuttings from 2018 saying, we're going to fill the river with treated water this summer because Narmada water is stopping. This is a, public projects are long, ongoing things and we must learn how to manage this. The big question everybody says, it won't be like it was in my childhood. Now, this is very difficult to address, okay? This won't be like it was. And this is true, people feel anxious. All of us like our memories to be preserved and because transitions of this sort are going to transform memories or take away those places. A lot of people feel bitter about it. And I understand that. There's very little one can do. As an urban designer, as an architect, I feel a little less so. I, I, I see the possibilities for the future and I feel like telling people, you know, new memories will be formed. Uh, there will be young people who will grow up with this and then they will refuse to have anything changed here. Uh, so we must look to the future, not just to preserving our past. That in this is in 2012, already people are running around, forming memories about this place. This lady says that she comes here to study, I, I don't believe that, but... <laughs> and, 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 and there are, uh, uh, there are, you know, many happy memories now being formed. Uh, despite the facts of the project, ill-informed Ill public opinion sometimes disrupted project implementation. And so, as a profession, as a government, we need to learn how to better to deal. Now I'll go a little faster and tell you about the Vishwanath Dam project, which is started in 2018, rapidly, rapidly uh, uh, going on, and be finished very soon. Many of you might be aware of it, but only a portion of it was finished when the Prime Minister actually went in and inaugurated it. There's a little small portion that is still ongoing, I'll tell you. So here's Varanasi, you can see the Ganges, the bend on the Ganges on which Varanasi is situated, ancient city. Uh, mind you, most of these buildings are more, no more than 300 years old. Huh? They are not ancient from 2000 years ago. But most of the city that you see today is three, 400 years. None of the buildings on the, on the Ganges is more older than that. A lot of it built by, by, uh, uh, by the Marathas in this place. 
and it's a dense, severely stressed urban settlement. It's not just this mythical city, it has lots of city problems. The precinct that we are talking about is that little yellow rectangle there. And that's what it looks like. When you come closer, that's what it looks like. If you come here, that's it. You see uh, the Kashi Vishwanath Mandir, which is this one here, Yanvyapi Masjid here, and Manikarnika Ghat here, the three important sort of locations here. And uh, the terrain is, it's a hill. Okay, you can see here, from here, this is 100 feet almost up. It's a climb up. Uh, that's the terrain, goes up like that, then drops, and the Kashi Mandir is actually behind the hill, not on top of the hill. Uh, the temple and the masjid have a long checkered history. I don't need to go into that. Many times the temple was destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt, etc. Till Ailevai Holkar built the this is, this is the masjid as it stands today, that's the old temple, and this was the, masjid, uh, the temple that was built by her in, uh, uh, I forget the date just now, and the gold, gold plating of the dome was done by Ranjit. Uh, that's the barricaded Gyanvapi Masjid right next to the Supreme Court has ordered it's barricading for protection, and the temple was hemmed in by development on all sides. That's yellow is the temple, red is the mosque. The character of the area around it, you can see it's a dead settlement. Okay, it's narrow lanes, it's crowded lanes, lots of pilgrims, lots of tourists. Animals, open gutters, ad hoc encroachments like this sewage treatment plant which has been built in front here. Uh, actually more interesting is this on top of here, buildings built on top of old structures like this. Last time that some infrastructure improvement was taken up in this area was uh, in 1822 when James Princep drew up some plans for infrastructure and for emptying city lakes. Nobody seems to have done much about it. Gandhiji in 1916 visited the temple and made a famous speech where he said, something must be done about this temple. We must, it must be, if our temples are not models of roominess and cleanliness, what can our self-government be? So he saw this as an important thing that needed to be done. So when the design for this was done, this was the precinct that was carved out as a special area development board. And I, our job was to build a master plan. Uh, the government purchased properties in the area between Vishwanath Mandir and the Kanchis, uh, cleared the area and redeveloped it according to the plan to provide, to, to sort of foreground the Mandir, provide amenities, lots of amenities for comfort, safety, security of tourists, pilgrimage path leading up from the Kanchis to the mandir, provide a setting for social, cultural, civic exhibitions and improve the gods. This was the objective that was, was, was framed out as we went ahead. Here you are, the master plan, just quickly run you through what has been done. So uh, that's the master plan. The first, the first master plan we did, you know, when we did, was this. Then it started evolving. Master plans are meant to evolve. Then they evolve further like this and this. Then, when the demolition started, we found many temples inside that had been encroached upon by buildings like this. Okay, so lots of people who claimed that these buildings were ancient heritage were actually built atop temples. Uh, all these temples that were found had to be accommodated in the master plan, so the master plan was changed once again. So that's the design of the precinct. What used to look like this, this was our master plan for it. Yeah, this is, let me just explain it to you. This the, let's start with the Mandir Parisa. So that's the area of the master plan I'm talking about. It used to be hemmed in, had a very tight uh, uh, Parisa around it. It was like this. Uh, look at it a little closely here. So what we did was we took this axis, uh, we took two squares, 
straighten them to match the additional structure and the root down to the Ganges, added a little more to it and that was the pulse, 42 meters by 75 meters, not very big. This whole area is 40,000 square meters, it's like a large plot, it's not really. Okay. And that's the plan of it, you can see that's now what you can see in an area that has been built like this. So that's the, the outside area. I worked along with a temple architect and a stone manufacturer. They manufacture temples to design this. We designed the proportions and everything. All the decoration was done by, by the architect. And that's what it looks like now, as you can see. And that's the temple within, with space all around. And that's how people are able to see the place. The Mandir Chowk is the civic space outside it. That's here. Right. And we took an equivalent rectangle on the other side, uh, mind you, uh, the, that's how it emerged. You can see here, that's the ground floor plan, the three levels. A lot of this is actually toilets, offices, storerooms, etc. All those spaces have been provided here and that's what it looks like now. I, I told you this section, it drops here. We were able to use it to create this drop here and as you can see that's the drop that we were able to create and that's how it has been built now. Uh, that's when you look at from the temple parisar look towards the, that's what it looks like and it's lit up at night. So. The approaches to this uh, were many, uh, they've all been kept and uh, so that's from this tight road here and various others. As you can see, if you look at that one, used to be from, that's the main approach to the temple. We've, we've changed the entrance. It used to be below shops and things like that. So now that's there. And then of course from the Ganges, when you come up, there's this gateway that is on axis to the temple. And that's the gateway that has been created. This is the street which used to cut across, uh, connecting two sides of the city. And that's the gateway you can see here, uh, that leads to the other side. So the connections of the city have been kept alive there. The pilgrim's path, when people come, you know, when they came earlier, they came here, they would come uh, here and then have to go up this lane or up this lane. Uh, when you went up this lane, this gap here, uh, that's, uh, that's what view that you saw first. Uh, you can just go back. There were these, sorry, back. there was these uh, sewage treatment things here that you can see. And, and you can see here, that's what they are. And that's the pathway you took to go to the temple. Uh, amidst all of this, and you, uh, the other path was through this, you went through that gate. It had its charm, but also for people, who, uh, it, it was messy, dirty, difficult, uncomfortable. Not to, uh, so that's... And that now changes. And the whole idea was for us, I think, that you come here, uh, you come by boat, you get to get comfortably get off on a pier, come up here, there's a cascade of steps that leads you up to this gateway. Uh, the temple, presence of the temple on the Ganges is through this gateway. You come up here, then the buildings direct you and your vision and your eyes, and vista, towards this next gateway. That's the entrance to, this, to the shop. You see the temple behind, actually through the gateway. You see the temple on axis. Come to this shop, come to the third gateway. So you have one gateway, two gateway, and three gateway, till you finally get to the temple. So it's sort of a, 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 sort of a journey. Uh, and that's what it looks like today. Uh, so that's, that's, this has not been removed as yet, because a new sewage treatment plant is being built here. That's where you come up, go through this gateway, go here, go here. All of this work is still ongoing. Many cultural civic institutions like uh, hospice, city, uh, Moksha Bhavan as they call it, city museum, spiritual gallery, multi-purpose hall, uh, all of these located on the pathway. Uh, the, the guards were important to manage. There was this beautiful building, which of course later on got hidden by these uh, turrets and that uh, the, this is the plan of the guards, that's where the guards are. Uh, if you see it here, 
the idea was to create this cascade of steps. That's Manikarnika Ghat. So this big structure here, which holds the ramp to take people up, actually forms a sort of a baffle so that these carts at the back can have their privacy. These people who are going to the temple can have their privacy and move up. And that was basically the idea. So this was the, the, the rendering that was done at the time. And here you are. That's that ramp structure. That's the Manikarnika Ghat, which have also been properly redone now with platforms, etc. That's the wall being built. Uh, it will get done in another month or so. And that's what is proposed in its place. Pilgrim tourist facilities, you, have, you know, places to keep your chapels and, uh, uh, and your bags and lockers and wash up a bit, etc. All of it in various places. Lines for queuing, administration, security, all of these things become extremely important here. And, and so I'm not going to go into details of that. The project progressed very fast. That was one of the aims of the project to say that these sort of things can be done. Here you are in September 2020. And during COVID times, March 21 and November 21, and uh, that is March 22. So fairly recent. Uh, still a few months away, it will be finished. Major issues discussed here. Our project will destroy the identity of Varanasi. This is what got told many, many times. Uh, you know, uh, I felt like telling people, let's see the size of this. If you look at this, it's 40,000 square meters. If you zoom out, that's where it is. And if you zoom out, that's where it is. And that's where it is. That's where it is. Nothing done in a place like this is going to affect all of Varanasi. It's a small intervention, an important intervention, for, but this was impossible often to convince people of, that it's a tiny intervention. Of course, very, very bombastic claims were made that the city's old identity is now under threat. Of course, many of these were, uh, you know, unthinking ones, uh, in, in uh, Vishwanath corridor is trampling Kashi's soul. That's these, uh, that's people in the wire. A culture in danger is what was said. Uh, uh, locals are cast over lost heritage. Uh, these are the sort of things that caught the imagination of a lot of people. Now, I didn't catch too much. Beautification plan destroys oldest neighborhood, etc. So these are. The second is the project will dispossess people of their ancestral properties and livelihoods. Yes, indeed, it, will, it, it takes away things. But most of this process was built on very generous compensation. And that nobody wanted to. None of it was done using, using uh, the force of eviction. Okay. Uh, actually, all 300 properties were purchased for 450 crores. Now you work out uh, whether this was generous or not. Indeed, some people's precious ancestral homes. Very few people actually had their homes there. Most of the people were absentee landlords. The rest were tenants and encroachers. Everybody was compensated. Absentee landlords, of course, very happy to receive money for their property, which they thought they had lost. Uh, the tenants and, uh, and people generously compensated. Uh, so it wasn't meant to be uh, as draconian as it was made out to be. Projects will destroy temples in the area. It is meant to destroy the mosque. This was also uh, a lot of attempt was made. Um, quite the opposite. It discovered new temples here. Not, and, 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 and you know, all these temples continue to exist and are in much better shape now they were restored. Uh, you know, there were questions like this being raised. Of course, in a public discourse, you will get politics, you know, and, and, and this goes on, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the kind of thing. This is a vanity project intended solely for political gain, is what a lot of people try to say. Uh, uh, populism, etc., and demolition of iconic buildings, etc., Everybody forgets that in 1916, Gandhiji said, to karo, facilities to banao. That sort of thing gets forgotten. 
once again, the last way it will not be like the Kashi I remember, is what a lot of people will say. And that's true. You can, you can have very nice memories of those lanes in that particular place. Kashi has many more lanes, but that particular place will not be there. And not much can be done. Uh, all that we can say is that the, that, that we put in place can form new memories and be better. So, many things like that. So, despite the facts of the project, ill-informed public opinion sometimes can disrupt public work. Okay. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a thing we see happening in lots of places. We, we, because we work on lots of public projects. We see that we don't have well-informed, fact-based, recent constructive discourse that can provide, that is meant to provide uh, 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 good feedback. Uh, it, it's in fact often ill-informed. I'm amazed how many times I've run into people who have never actually seen a presentation or design or anything, but they keep talking about the, the thing. And then they say, Gambo Dikayane. So what can be done in this case? You can only improve yourself. You cannot stop other people from doing that. So I believe that government agencies and professionals need to. Once again, I say, we don't have a culture for it. It's for our profession to build it up. What, what techniques and capacities have we developed at NCP to do this? Okay. Uh, there are two stages. When the design is being developed, you need to do a lot of explaining and consulting with people. And you do this in a variety of ways. You need to seek feedbacks and you need to seek inputs. If, 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 if we believe that we can do dispense with this, we are mistaken. We, we public projects require feedback and we must use it uh, to design better. During implementation, once you have heard all the questions, got all the feedback, then you need to explain, share information and address queries. And we in India do the, both these things uh, not well enough, though I must say we have put in lots of efforts. Uh, to. Now, we are planning urban design practice together. I'm an urban design planner. And so, well, this is me with black hair at that time, explaining the project in 1997 uh, to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, getting their feedback. Of course, they told me, why do you have to give houses to slum dwellers? Uh, you know, everybody will say different things to you, but we have a long tradition in our practice of opening up the studio, getting people together, and asking them questions. Here we have a workshop that we held for the professionals of the city, you can see uh, here uh, um, Bernard Cohn, the guy who originally proposed the idea of a riverfront here. Uh, these, are, these are people from the architectural community there uh, in workshops where we would put the design out and say, this is what we have done, what do you think? And we are listening to hear what they are saying. This is after the Bhuja earthquake. My colleague, uh, Balachandran, who is showing the development plan of the city to people. At that time, you couldn't be inside buildings. It was better to be in parks because the buildings were shaking. Uh, and, and, and here in Nagpur, in town planning schemes, you can see all the drawings pinned up here. Here's this gentleman trying to figure out what's going to happen to his plot. We do this all the time. In our practice, this is part of the culture of doing work. Uh, here's my colleague, Bindu, uh, explaining. I think this is in Morbi. Uh, explaining what is going to happen to people. This is the nature of work you need to do if you are really doing consultations. Sometimes we make samples. You can see on the right hand side that little paving pattern that's been done. And we put up these pictures and we wait for people to come on the sample site and tell us what do they think. Because people understand when they see something. I did a lot of this in the Central Vista uh, when the sample stretch was done. I would. I would call people. I was only interested in meeting the critics. I was not interested in meeting supporters because it was important to hear whether they have something to say. Call lots of people here to see it. Uh, and I would spend an hour with them explaining the design and asking them what they felt about it. Here is uh, my colleagues in the, talking in the Pune Riverfront. Uh, lots of stakeholder consultations here, opinion surveys. The important thing is to learn how to minute this and take the feedback into your design and to show your clients what the people are saying and why it needs to be brought in. So we have a long thing about this. Of course, after it's done, a lot of the project is about doing presentations and 
in schools, colleges, wherever you get an opportunity, you do presentations. Here is my colleague, uh, um, uh, Ganesh, presenting at uh, Christopher Benninger's place to a group of 200 people, something about the Pune Riverfront project. Frequently asked questions. After a while, you know all the questions that are being asked about it. And so it's better to write it up and your answers to questions and put them up on websites. So we are very adept at doing that, and that's what you have to do. People cannot imagine what we are imagining. There will be a time when everything will be showable in virtual reality. But, you know, they make, newspapers used to make ghastly illustrations like this about the riverfront. So in 2010, we made a big effort to try and people needed to know what this is going to be like in the future, what at least what we have imagined it to be. So we developed techniques for drawing visualizations of this sort. And these visualizations have to be real. People are interested in buildings, by the way. That's, uh, let me tell you a trick. Uh, they're not interested in buildings. They're interested in the life that is going to be there, and they want you to be honest. They, they don't want you to leave out the fact that India is a poor country, there will be vendors, do you have places for them? Does your vision have a place for these people? Uh, a place like this, who can imagine what's going to be here? So we drew it up and of course, uh, we, we didn't imagine that suddenly Ahmedabad is going to become clean. You can see these cows there, and the cows are going to remain. And when people see these cows, they say, ah, now you got it, now you know what Ahmedabad is like. <laughs> Uh, models are extremely important. That's a model of the Ahmedabad Riverfront. Uh, we were, you know, that was when the urban design was done. That is in an exhibition. Models being put up. Uh, all sorts of models here. You can see that's the Bombay uh, Port Trust work. The model for that. Here's another model for it. Uh, here's another model for it. We are now using 3D printing techno techniques to great effect. And we, we, we make comparisons of different cities and show comparisons of building fabrics. And people understand this. Bombay project would have been impossible if we were not able to explain this to people. Exhibitions are extremely important. Uh, you saw the riverfront views. These views were blown up to 20 feet by uh, 8 feet tall. Uh, and, and put up in exhibitions of this sort so that people could stand there and imagine themselves to be part of this space. So this technique we developed to great effect. You can see here a report from 2010, uh, this lady getting a glimpse of tomorrow here. So, and, and I showed you this already. Other exhibitions in which this would be done. Uh, these, you know, if people come throng here. All sorts of people come, as you can see, uh, you know, this is the, and here is Mr. Ambani, I guess, deciding what to buy on the riverfront. Uh, and, and this was a real estate fair uh, on which, uh, in which we made a presentation of Ahmedabad's plan for the central business district. Everybody came, they wanted to see things, they would argue with people, they would show, that's what I see, that's what I don't see. Uh, here explaining, you have, to have, you have to stand there, wait to explain things to people. Uh, here's the Kashi project being explained to architects. So exhibitions are important. Reports, brochures, posters, graphic novels. Mind you, our contracts do not have scope of work of producing this stuff. But we better now develop a culture of doing this. We should have that. Many brochures like this fold out brochures, uh, you know, little things like this, explaining the whole project to people, maybe in regional languages. We don't have a culture of producing this. Uh, I, I, I keep making these brochures. You can see here that's the Mumbai project explained like this in diagrams of various sorts. That's the Central Vista project explained to people in various ways. But I have to still find agencies, government agencies, that are eager to, to print uh, 20,000 copies of these brochures and send them out, you know. That doesn't happen. Unfortunately, we don't have a culture for it. In Ahmedabad, we have learned a lot, and we are doing this a lot more. So now the municipal corporation is far more proactive in giving this information. We also tried out using comics uh, to explain our projects. This, was, this is an experiment that is ongoing about how to show the Kashi project transformation through comics, uh, and that was kind of fun. Websites, social media, we developed a website for the Central Vista project, did get used. They developed one afterwards. 
using some of the stuff that we have done, uh, websites are the best place to put authentic, real, official information. But we don't have a culture for doing that. That's the central list of website. Social media, quick, easy, information access. Uh, nowadays, you, talks like this are on YouTube, so they also become accessible. It's, it's also amazing. You put all of this out. It will help all those who are truly interested in finding information. The people who, are, who will not, you know, there are people for whom they will not let facts come in the way of a good theory that they have. Uh, those sort of people will never look at this. But it doesn't matter. You must at least get the rest of the people. Okay. Videos and animations. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but here's one that we made for Gandhi Ashram project. You know, it's a uh, quick, uh, you can now put them out on WhatsApp, you know, uh, what we are trying to do. So here was a plan of uh, Gandhi Ashram, because here there is a lot of attempt to, to, to mislead the public. And so that was that. Finally, press briefings, etc. So many press, you have to learn how to, how to do this. Uh, you know, you have to do talks of this sort, and one has to learn how to do that, and, and that's often the case. As I said, all of us need to learn how to better engage with the public. Thank you very much.